We are going to look at chapter five, Roman history. This is another big chapter, and so you know, in college this was an entire semester, so to do this topic in such a short amount of time does seem a bit stressful for your history teacher. So section one is the rise of Rome, and so you guys can go ahead and look at those pictures uh, around, the pictures of the map and everything as I read this. The impact of geography. It is in the middle of the Mediterranean, which is a sea and not an ocean, which of course has Africa to the south and it has Europe to the north. And right now this is where the people are streaming through the people that are trying to escape civil war in the Middle East. Um, you can see that it is larger and more arable, which means that the land is more plantable th than Greece. <clears throat> um, the rivers, uh, river valleys were the Po to the north and the Tiber to the middle of the boot, okay? Rome is inland, accessible by boat, is defensible because it has hills around it. And that was very important back then when somebody had to climb up a hill in order to get to the invading, you know, to, to invade a city and you have to carry everything up a hill in order to invade somebody. This is a little bit before airplanes. So the people of uh, Italy. So there's a legend if you look to the right and you see a woman and there's two babies drinking from her. It seems odd, but that is the legend of Romulus and Remus. That uh, replica of that statue is actually at Caesar's Palace. Raised um, by that she-wolf and they trace their boundaries with a plow. So uh, Romulus kills Remus and thus that's how Rome is um, established. In reality, it's the Truscans from Etteria and the Latins from Latium. They used iron, bronze, and silver. Uh, Rome came under the control of the Etruscans, who brought style of dress and organizations to their army. <clears throat> the Roman Republic was a form of government in which the leader is not a monarch and certain citizens have the right to vote. We are a republic. We are not a democracy. Okay, just so you're aware. You are familiar with this type of government because you live under it. Uh, you are Las Vegans because you live in Las Vegas. Romans were from a city of Rome that became more than a city, but an empire. Romans conquered the Latins, uh, the Greeks, the remaining Etruscans to control virtually all of Italy. Romans gave citizenship as a reward to loyalty, giving them interest in Rome's success. Rome was successful because they were good diplomats, shrewd at giving citizenship, and allowed states to run their own affairs. They were also great in military matters. So uh, slavery was an option, but not always an option. So what we see here are the government of Rome and how we had the patricians and the plebeians. I do know this is a question. You need to identify the difference between the patricians and the plebeians. Well, um, I guess if you get to pick, you'd probably choose to be a patrician because you're a landowner. You're in the ruling class. Men could vote um, and they were elected officials and elected officials. Uh, the plebeians, however, were craftspeople, um, farmers. They were the largest group of people. So sometimes you'll hear the term plebeians associated with the general public of anywhere, the plebeians. Um, and then, of course, the men could vote. Okay, now going down to the chief executive officers of uh, Rome, consuls and the praetors. So we have two chosen every year of the consul. They ran the government and led the army into war. And the praetors uh, were in charge of civil law. Civil is usually, how do I explain this? Like what goes on around you as far as how governments are run. And then you have the Senate and the Centuriate Assembly. So the Senate was 300 of those patricians up above and they serve for life and they advise government officials. In the Centurate Assembly, um, elected chief officials and passed laws. And we go down here to the further rise of Rome and we have a beautiful picture and map again and the plebeians and patricians were forbidden to marry. Uh, they were separate, you know, kind of like the sects of India. Uh, there were other limitations on plebeians which led to struggle, which led to the Council of the Plebes. By two, uh, 287 BC, all male Roman citizens were supposed to be equal, but it really wasn't. The Roman Republic was not a democracy. So we have t uh, two things here, the 12 tables, which were Rome's first code of laws in 450 BC, the product of a farming society, and then really the laws of nations, which is the universal law code based on reason that established standards of justice, innocent until proven guilty in defense before a judge. And that is the um, body of laws that the Romans used for Romans and non-Romans. 
Now, the Punic Wars, I know another P war, uh, as we were looking at the Peloponnesian War before this, and the Persian Wars in Greece, and now we've got the Punic Wars, and sometimes I think you bet they can't seem to use a different letter to name their wars during this period of time. But right now, we have the Punic Wars, and we didn't just have one. We didn't just have two. We have three. Um, look at the map to the right, and you can see Africa, and you can see Carthage is on the tip of Africa, and you can see that the island that the boot of Italy is kicking, which is Sicily, is Italian. And so what you're seeing here is this area of conflict. So you will have to identify the differences between these wars. You will just need to know, like, what are some of the major things that happened in one of these wars as compared to the other wars? So, the First Punic War, you see the dates. Rome won, created a Roman navy, navy to defeat, defeat Carthage. Carthage felt they owned Sicily, an island that is being kicked, like I stated before. Now, let's look at that Second Punic War. Rome won again. And this is where we see Hannibal. You guys have probably heard the name Hannibal. It's a very strong sounding name. This is somebody from Carthage. The Battle of Cannae brought elephants to Italy through Spain. Now look at that, look at that map and picture an elephant on a boat going across to Spain and then up over the Pyrenees through the Alps. It's poor elephants. Rome was losing, so they sent the army to fight Carthage in Carthage rather than Italy. So that was a bit surprising because you know, everybody was in Italy. By the Third Punic War, Carthage is defeated. No destroyed. 50,000 men, women, and children were sold into slavery. Famously, salt was poured on the ground so that nothing could live in the future. If you were to go out today and put salt on a plant, you will watch it slowly die. And not only does it die, it kills the soil, which soil is living and breathing. So the Romans didn't just want them to die. They wanted them to die forever. Okay, we're in section two, and this is the Roman, um, the Republic to Empire. So, when we're looking at the Republic to the Empire, so one of the reasons why I loved Roman history in college was because it's like watching a soap opera. And unfortunately, these characters don't move around on a TV screen, but if you get into it, you'll see these uh, crazy lives of these people. So look over here to the left with um, Gaius and Tiberius Gracchus. We tried to fix Rome's problems by bringing about land reform in this, but for the small landowners. Uh, rich landowners, uh, like most of the Senate, did not like this, and so we were killed. So it was just this up and down people falling in love, falling out of love, illegitimate children, people dying, people being killed, uh, patricide, matricide, infanticide, suicide, murder, just all kinds of murders and killings. Marius at the top right raised an army by promising land in exchange for loyalty and service and having volunteers swear an oath to the general rather than to the state. Now think about that. They're not swearing to Rome. They're swearing to Marius. His own army Sulla did the same after the Senate gave him control over their armies in Asia Minor. Sulla fought Marius in a civil war, taking control of Rome and establishing a new type of control of, with their own armies. So it's kind of like having a privatized army. Uh, you see Sulla here. I won the civil war between Marius and myself. I tried to restore power to the Republic, a form of government in which the leader is not a monarch and certain citizens have the right to vote. Okay. So now let's look at these other players in this big game for the first triumvirate. Uh, you see the three leaders, that's tri is in three, the three leaders, but we all know this never works out. Whether you're living with three people in a room or you have three animals, it's just somebody feels left out. So here we go. So we have Caesar. And you all know Caesar because there's plays written about him. He's pretty famous. Caesarian sections were named after him and the month of July. So once Crassus was dead, I marched on Rome with my army and caused a civil war against Pompey or Pompey, depending on how you want to say it, and became the dictator. I was given military power in Gaul. This would be France today. Now you see Crassus. I was given military power in Syria. Yes, you heard about ISIS in Syria even today. I died in 53 BC. I'm known for my wealth. And then you see Pompeii over there to the right. Remember the island of Pompeii where the volcano goes off and then everybody is just kind of frozen in time and buried under ash. Uh, that, of course, is named for him. I was given military power in Spain. A city that was covered by volcanic eruption was named after me. I was killed in battle. Pompeii was considered the original. This was considered Pompeii was an outsider in the originally secret alliance. So very, very fascinating. Like I said, all kinds of crazy things happening in the Roman Republic. 
So Julius Caesar of the Triumvirate is eventually the one that comes to power. He was born to a patrician family around 100 BC. Uh, early life was a time of turmoil, marriages, affairs, told you about this, served in the army outside of Rome, waited for the death of Sulla before returning to Rome. 63 BC, Caesar elected to the office of Pontifus Maximus. It's a great name. Highest priest of the Roman state religion. 50s uh, BC were a part of the first triumvirate. Uh, Caesar governs Gaul. We talked about that being France and conquers Gaul. Ordered back to Rome to cross the Rubicon uh, with army in 49. At this time, uh, Caesar, he started a large scale building projects. He named 900 people to the Senate to weaken it. You know, water it down. You had too many people. There's too many people talking. So he could name himself a dictator and have absolute, be the absolute ruler for life. He distributed property to veterans of his army. Caesar never married um, the pharaoh Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt, with whom he allied, although he did and probably have a son together. Caesar, who admired Alexander the Great, spent the next four years further expanding the Roman Empire. Caesar never married... I, do, I have the exact same statements there twice. Apologize for that. So obviously, a dynamic leader must come to a dynamic end, and that's what happened to Caesar. The Roman senators, led by Brutus, who was, of course, his best friend, and Cassius assassinated Caesar in 44 BC, known as the Ides of March. You know, they say, beware of the Ides of March. Uh, is a day of the Roman calendar that corresponds with March 15th. It was marked by several religious observances and became notorious as the date of the assassination of Julius Caesar. The death of Caesar made the Ides of March a turning point in Roman history as one of the events that marked the transition from the historical period known as the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. Motives included jealousy, protection of the Republic. And that's in quotes because like, I'm trying to protect the Republic, but are you really, or are you just, you know, a little bit jealous or a little bit hungry for power? Um, and anger about the money spent by Caesar. Caesar's friend, Mark Antony, Caesar's great nephew and adopted son Octavian, and Marcus Lepidius, uh, or hunted down those involved in the assassination and formed the second triumvirate. So let's go deeper into this love affair, murder, assassinations, and everything else with power. And they say absolute power corrupts absolutely, so we can see a little of this. So Mark Antony hooks up with Caesar's woman, Cleopatra, over here to the right. Uh, uh, formed, here's the second triumvirate. It was formed in 43 BC. This triumvirate also succumbed to jealousy and ambition. So, so Mark Antony married Octavian's sister, but lived uh, and also had children with Cleopatra, who also had a child with Julius Caesar. Octavian raised an army and defeated Lepidus, then at Actium defeated Antony and Cleopatra, who committed dual suicide. Dual suicide, like they actually committed Romeo and Juliet style suicides. And you can see the area in the map, what we're talking about. But, you know, supposedly they let a snake bite them, and that's how they committed their suicide. So just, you know, that's the movie picture right there. It's just amazing how these things go down. I told you this was a crazy story about the Roman Republic. So now what we see here are Octavian in charge, named himself Caesar Augustus and Augustus and beyond. You will recognize Augustus from the month of August, or you'll recognize August from Caesar Augustus. Many people considered the Battle of Actium to mark the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Empire. Other people say that the Republic died under Julius Caesar because he had absolute power and didn't allow a Republic. Still others say that the Republic did not die until the Senate gave Octavian the title Augustus, the illustrious one. Now these are the things you debate in college on essays and stuff like that. Here you just need to be aware of it. Now the power after Julius Caesar died. Now we see Augustus and beyond, beginning of a time called Pax Romana, peace in Rome. Pax meaning peace. It lasted until 180 um, AD. Served as Pontifus Maximus, which was that high priest again. The surge in the Senate to 600 members. Uh, fire and police departments put government employees in, uh, in the government. Made army professional, which means they got paid. Public buildings and roads, rebuilt Rome, biggest external problem, people to the north. 
So imagine how many years of history I'm trying to get through in just a few minutes so that you aren't completely bored by this. But again, very fascinating stuff. Now we have Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. Crazy, crazy, mean, mean, mean people. Mean, mean people. Some people think it's from interbreeding amongst the upper classes that they, you know, would have all of these mental issues. They assumed more power from the Senate, created imperial bureaucracy, and openly ruled like leaders and not first citizens. Again, if you start to look up some of the things that these people did, they really began to be a little bit mentally disturbed in the people that they would kill and the way that they would do it. So on this slide, you get to see five good emperors, and uh, they were the ablest, the noblest, and the most dedicated rulers for Pax Romana at its height. Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Pius, Marcus Aurelius. They treated ruling class well, cooperated with the Senate, and maintained peace. They were tolerant, diplomatic, unparalleled period of peace and pro prosperity. And you can see some of their, um, the Punic War, Caesar's death, Augustus's death, and you could see the different growths of Rome. And then you get to see these five good emperors down below, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, who built that wall across the border of England and Scotland. I've had the privilege of walking on that wall. It is pretty amazing to think that a wall goes across an entire uh, country like that to keep the people from the north in Scotland out. Now we have um, section three, culture and society in the Roman world, which of course is fascinating. Roman art and architecture is just something that you can see and you know immediately that that is something that is Roman. And one of their famous things, of course, the Colosseums, their mosaics, which are tiny tiles placed together in the form of a picture and done in a way that looks like it was painted. And then, of course, the aqueducts. Architecture, often a Greek model with columns and square buildings, Romans expanded the architecture to use curved lines like arches, uh, vaults, and a dome even. Now think about building a dome with blocks at home when you're a child and how difficult that would be. They used concrete, cement to make larger buildings. They advanced engineering to build roads, bridges, and aqueducts. One of the things they're absolutely known for is their ability to connect each piece of their empire through roads, moving goods and services faster in between each of those cities. Romans followed the Greek style, especially in statues. They reproduce famous Greek statues. Romans produce realistic instead of idealistic statues. They decorated homes and public buildings with the mosaics, which as I said, were those small tiles. Now look to the right where it says literature. We have Virgil, Horace, uh, satires, Livy, and then the history, who wrote the history of Rome. And so you could see all that. Virgil, very famous because he distinguished the poet of the age. He wrote the Aeneid, the story of the founding of Rome by Aeneas, who is portrayed as the ideal Roman. So anytime we're looking at this, we see the Roman family, and of course it's male-dominated, paterfamilias, uh, the dominant male, usually the eldest male. Paterfamilias dominated the entire household, including wives, children, and slaves. Uh, Romans raised children in the home. Slaves were educated and usually Greek, were hired to teach children in the home. Children could be sold into slavery. Roman boys learned reading, writing, and moral principles, family values, law, rhetoric, in addition to having physical training to prepare them to be soldiers. Roman girls were taught to read and run their household accounts. Boys graduated at the age of 16 when they were considered adults and could begin wearing the toga. Key okay, attitude towards women uh, in charge of home life. Paterfamilias arranged marriages for daughters, marriage uh, legal at 12 for girls and 14 for boys, though marrying this young was unusual. Roman women often had male guardians out in public. Roman marriages were meant to be for life, but obviously through what we've been seeing, divorce was permitted or playing around on the side. Women could own, sell, and inherit property. Women were not supposed to uh, participate in politics and could not hold any public off political office. By the second century, the paterfamilias no longer had absolute authority over children, uh, could no longer sell children into slavery, and could not have children put to death. Well, thank goodness. Women were no longer required to have guardians. Slavery in Rome, back to the issue of slavery. Seems like we're always gonna discuss religion and slavery when it comes to history. Romans were dependent on slave labor. Most slaves were foreign prisoners of war. Greek slaves were in demand as tutors, musicians, doctors, and artists. Greeks would voluntarily sell themselves uh, as slaves to return to their family life, uh, send 
uh, pay and possibly for Roman citizenship to end their service. Slaves were used to build public roads, aqueducts, public projects, and some slaves were treated humanely, given wages, and others were abused. And some, of course, become uh, warriors in the ring while they would fight. And those slaves were gladiators. And you guys see a lot about gladiators. Great movie again. Romans were concerned about slave revolts and the slaves outnumbered citizens. That should be a concern. Spartacus led the slave revolt in 73. Spartacus was a gladiator, fought against his owners. Gladiators were slaves. He defeated several armies before Crassus, the first triumvirate, defeated Spartacus's slave army. The slave army was crucified and their bodies spaced every 100 feet on the Appian Way, the road from Rome to the south. And that was to send a very distinct message. Uh, when you see bodies hanging on stakes every 100 feet, it does send a message about revolt. So, daily life in Rome. Rome was the largest city in the empire with one million inhabitants. Now remember, there's no plumbing, so you can imagine what this is. Cart traffic, horses go and poop everywhere. You go poop in a, in a bowl, you gotta dump it in the streets. I mean, it's just a crazy thing to think of that many people living in one area. It was overcrowded congestion. Uh, they had to avoid further congestion. Rome was not safe at night. Augustus organized a police force, but it did little to deter the crime. Like any other large city, they had problems with graffiti, sewage, and you can actually see the graffiti. And I took a class in college that would talk about the graffiti of people that were poor because typically you're just reading the history of rich people that was written down. So, rich versus poor. The wealthy in Rome lived in large houses that were actually villas, a group of buildings. You know, kind of outdoor, like you go from the sleeping chamber across the area, the courtyard, to the eating chamber, that area. The poor lived in apartment buildings called insulae, uh, which reached as many as six stories high. The buildings were made of concrete and often collapsed since they were poorly built. Remember, they hadn't figured out how to do frames with uh, really strong structures inside at this point. Fire was a constant threat in the insulae because of cooking fires, candles, torches, and other open flames. High rents forced families to live together in one-room insulae. With no plumbing or uh, central heating, insulates were uncomfortable and definitely unsanitary. Uh, we might use the word disgusting, really, um, for the smells that must have existed at this time between body odor and human odor. So, we have public programs. So the emperors built temples, marketplaces, baths. Yes, they had public baths, believe it or not, and a lot of politics took place there. Theaters, stadiums were used uh, by the public. Emperors also provided food for the city poor. About 200,000 people received free grain. I guess that would be like um, some of the programs we offer with WIC or unemployment, that type of thing. Entertainment was provided on a grand scale. Public officials believed as long as the poor were fed and entertained, they would not revolt. Remember, there were more of them than, than there were of the rich people. The phrase bread and circuses was often used to describe this phenomenon. Stadiums like the Colosseum and the Circus Maximus were used for gladiator shows, horse and chariot races, and other entertainments. Held in the Colosseum were free to the public. Criminals and slaves would fight to the death, as well as animals. Criminals and wild animals were often opponents to professional gladiators. Thousands of animals killed in one day. So sad. Kept people's minds off the problems in the empire and showed the power of the government. Bloody, violent, and popular. And then there came a new movement across Rome and across this entire area. And that was the development of Christianity. Prior to this, of course, the Romans were just as the Greeks and had many gods. They were polytheistic. And so to go from many gods to one was really, really difficult for them, especially for the vendors that sold things for you to sacrifice to the gods. They were going to lose money on this deal. So Roman gods, Romans discovered all new gods all of the time. This happened as they travel from country to country, learning about them from people they conquered. It could make things quite complicated. For example, a soldier going on a journey would need to ask Mercury, the god of travel, to help, as well as uh, Mithras, the special soldiers' god, that he might also need to make a sacrifice to the temple of Neptune if he traveled by sea. So... If you look down to the left while I go over this, this is um, what they feel Jesus of Nazareth looked like as an artistic recreation of his features at the time of somebody from the Middle East of Jewish descent. Okay, so that would be a more accurate picture than the people that were painting during the um, Renaissance era. 
So you could see the background of Roman religion. Roman religion had declined during the late Republic. Augustus brought back traditional festivals and ceremonies like Bracchus um, to revive the Roman religion. Um, Dionysus would be the god of wine, that type of thing. So that is a special festival of drinking. The official state religion focused on a number of gods baked, based on those Greek gods. Romans believed that practicing the proper rituals brought them into the right relationship with the gods. It was about what you did. So when Christ came around and uh, Jesus Christ came around and changed that, it was very, very difficult for people to understand, even the people of Jewish background which uh, Jewish people had independence in Hellenistic empire of Alexander the Great, which means that they were kind of still able to worship their God. Uh, Judea became a Roman province. You remember Judea from a, a chapter or so ago where it showed that part of Israel. Roman province in um, AD 6. The Roman official called the procurator was in charge of Judea. Not all Jews were supportive of Roman rule, and so they wanted to revolt. Some cooperated and others did not, mostly divided along tribal lines. Remember the 12 tribes of Israel. Jews revolted in 66 AD, but were defeated by the Romans, and their temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. Remember, you can go there and visit it today, but it's just a wall. The rise of Christianity. The Roman Empire... Uh, it was practiced by more people than any other religion. The, vo the view of God, humans, and the world was very different than Greco-Roman and originally a sect of Judaism because Jesus of Nazareth was Jewish. They believed Jesus, was, who was a Jew, died so that humans could have salvation and eternal life. Again, it was a very, very, um, very unique. And sometimes unique is not smiled upon and is persecuted. So you could see Christianity and the spread of Christianity. It was monotheistic, one God. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Love God and love your neighbor. Initially angered both Romans and Jews. So Jesus was crucified and believed to have been risen again. And then Paul of Tarsus, Saul, uh, began to take it on from there. Paul killed Christians with rocks. It's called a stoning death. Um, but then he was converted and began to spread Christianity and wrote several books in the New Testament. So spread using Roman roads. Remember, I told you they were great roads. Small minority initially ignored and then pers uh, prosecuted on and off during uh, starting with Nero. But then Emperor Constantine uh, was the first Christian emperor. It's a great story. Triumph of Christianity. Theodius, the the great ruled over Christian Rome. Christianity became more organized with bishops having significant powers. So um, imagine this small group of people and then it becomes the central force of this entire area where even to this date the Pope lives in Rome in Vatican City which is a separate country within the walls of Rome. Why was Christianity so popular? Well, it offered the new message to Romans, personal belief of salvation after death. If life is difficult here, the hereafter is an improvement. Familiarity with um, origin myths of other Bible stories that were related to well-known myths of other religions. Some believe that to be the flood theory. Um, filled the need to belong. Christian communities supported each other and individual citizens. They would support each other with food, um, with money. And they were first symbolized not by the cross, which was, of course, a symbol of um, death, but by the fish, because above Jesus's head, they say were carved the letters, this is the king of the Jews, which then spelled out the anacronym for fish. And so that's why the fish becomes this. Okay, according to tradition, ancient Christians during their persecution of the Roman Empire in, in the first few centuries after Christ used the symbol to mark their meeting places. So then we get into this slide which is um, before adopting Christianity, Romans also believed that the emperors became gods, so everyone had to make a sacrifice to the emperor. Christians often got into trouble because they refused to do this, and they had to worship in secret. Despite the secrecy, more people became Christian. By the 4th century AD, Christianity was so popular that the emperor Constantine decided to make it the official religion. And so you can sit here and see some of these instruments of destruction of um, crucifixion and how people die through crucifixion. Now we're on the decline of Rome. Some people feel that the United States is in the same decline and they use Rome as an example of that. 
So you see, after Marcus Aurelius's death in 180, a, a period of conflict and confusion followed. Civil wars. Didn't we see that in Persia as well, with no serious um, person going on after uh, Xerxes? The military government under several rulers, uh, Septimus Severius, paid the military and no other officials. So you can see all this. We get death, um, we get the plague, and, and then people die off, and there's no central government to do anything. Invasions in the east and north cause Rome to spread military too thin. And there's only so many people. You can't go all over Europe and control every single corner of it. When you're way up in Britain and you have to cross you know, the North Sea to get there and try and control the government, they didn't have cell phones to do this or computers. Just too big of an area for some area for them to control. So then we have um, reforms of Diocletian and Constantine. Two emperors in the third and fourth century tried to bring Rome back to prominence through reforms. But you can see some of these problems. And eventually what happens is if you go over to Constantine, expanded Diocletian's government, enlarged government bureaucracy, enlarged army, began construction of new capital city for the empire in Byzantium. So what, you're moving, you're moving the capital from Rome over to Byzantium. And yes, some people feel that this is the fall of Rome. This is when the Roman Empire collapses. Some cite earlier times. You know, it's just this one thing, like I said before, that you get to discuss when you're in college. And then finally, the decline of Rome. Two capitals, Rome and Byzantium in Constantinople, divided the empire, weakened the rule, invading tribes, increased pressure in Western Roman Empire. The Huns from Asia conquered the Visigoths. Aren't these great names? I mean, it's just incredible. The Visigoths moved south to escape the Huns. The Visigoths settled in Roman territory in allies, but soon revolted. The Romans were defeated by the Germans in, seven thir in 378. In 410, the German Visigoths sacked Rome. Vandals invaded southern Spain and Africa. And then in 450, the Vandals sacked Rome. So, just a crazy time. Why did it fall? Go to the bottom and look. Many theories have proposed the explain for the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, including Christianity's emphasis on a spiritual kingdom instead of worshiping, you know, the leader. Traditional Roman values declined. More non-Italians gained prominence. And when they say traditional Roman values decline, they're talking about some of the different things that were happening within the decline of the family. Lead poisoning. Interesting, huh? That you could kill off people through lead poisoning. You go a little crazy when you get lead in your system. The plague and the fear of, you know, getting together. Rome was unable to put together a workable political system. So all of these are reasons why they say Rome fell. So think about it. Over and over again, empires rise and expand their control and then decline. While the largest Western Empire and Roman Empire was not the largest or the most powerful in the world, the Han in China at the same time was much larger and powerful. Consider the violence in the Roman Empire compared to that of today, and Eastern Roman Empire was able to survive a thousand years.